next week so hold on to the questions um, hot off the press this really because um, last night you know the sort of like the the meeting that some of us went to just sort of uh, makes me think it would be good to you know sort of like just raise a question tonight and, and say is is all this Toronto blessing biblical or it's not Toronto blessing now is it it's Pensacola it's that there's kind of there's the Pensacola thing there's the um, you know the Toronto blessing thing and uh, you know tonight I just want to you know sort of like go through the scriptures and uh, you know and, and just ask is it biblical and uh, you know to really get what the Bible says or as I'm going to show you doesn't say <laughs> about it um, and but the first thing you know that really needs to be noted is is that you know I mean today it's a you know it's a craze literally I mean it's just you know it's just everywhere you go this is what Christians you know sort of like spirit filled Christians are talking about um, and uh, you know as if it's new now I've been on the charismatic Christian scene for over 25 years and I can tell you there is nothing new about the Toronto blessing or the Pensacola thing at all um, and in, in addressing it I'm not going to be saying anything different tonight than I was saying 20 years ago um, I mean there are certain aspects of it that have changed there are a, a kind of elements in it I mean let's 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 describe exactly what it is that we're talking about you know with uh, you know sort of like you know the Toronto blessing or you know these manifestations happening we're talking about thing you know sort of like people like this this so-called being slain in the spirit people falling over being you know sort of like knocked off their feet or whatever by the Holy Spirit you know sort of lying on their backs and things like that and a touch or someone you know sort of like laying hands on them down they go that's not new that was happening 30 years ago there's 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 absolutely nothing new about that at all um you know that historically is old hat um some of the newer things uh, i mean the laughing was you know would have only been spasmodic you know like of 20 25 years ago now that's a, a very main feature um, a lot of bodily jerking and convulsions now um, you know sort of like a loss of bodily control now what's interesting a decade ago the charismatic movement went through an obsession with demonization and, and the casting out of demons and what's interesting a very large number um, of Christians today who say that this you know Toronto blessing thing is of God and that these manifestations are of God what I find ironic these same people 10 years ago were taking this as evidence of the presence of evil spirits which I I just show you that to, to, to show how things change in people's minds and in the charismatic movement I mean what a decade ago would have been um, you know sort of like thought to have been the manifestation of evil spirits in someone and proof that they needed deliverance now um, is a, a, a kind of a manifestation of God's spirit on them and proof that God is moving in them um, the animal noises that's that's something that's fairly new um, but but I, I think it's more the speed at which it's spreading that tends to be a new element in regards to it the idea that you get outbreaks in a geographical location so everyone has to flock there and then take it away that's a new element so there are original aspects of it but by and large you know just you know to make it clear that it's not you know the idea of manifestations i mean it's like what we saw last night you know a guy up there you know kind of uh, you know there's someone here with gingivitis the lord wants to heal you or there's someone here with dermatitis at the top of their left ear now some people might think that i've said those two things and i'm parodying it i'm not they were two actual so-called words of knowledge last night words of knowledge that's not new you know like the way they do it this kind of thing oh you know there's uh, someone here with such and such um <clears throat> so that's not new 
and um, you know, but 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 we know what we're talking about. You know, we've been to meetings where it's happening. We've seen videos, extensive video, you know, footage of both the Toronto Church and the Pensacola. So we know kind of um, you know sort of um, what we're talking about. And fundamentally, just to you know sum it up, we're talking about the at meetings. Uh, there tends to be worship, protracted chorus singing. I don't say there's anything wrong with that in particular. Um, but then the point testimonies about what God has done in other people's lives when they've had the so-called blessing. And their ministry led very much from the front. And people exalted and then whipped up for these things to happen. And if I'd sum it up that what you've got are meetings where the whole climate, everything is leading up to people going down to the front, receiving ministry, inverted commas. And of course, these manifestations, uh, you know, from falling over, um, you know, to pogoing on the spot or jerky movements or, or whatever, that these tending to be the sign, or animal noises, these tending to be the sign that God is working in those people so that's that that's what i'm you know sort of like today people are saying toronto blessing others are saying the pensacola thing i'm just saying this is uh, a feature of the charismatic movement that has always been there and uh, again let's remember we're not saying anything against the baptism of the holy spirit we're saying nothing against the gifts of the holy spirit we believe in that my concern uh, for all this is that it gets in the way of uh, you know sort of like the gifts of the spirit uh, you know sort of moving in the way that they should so that's that's basically what we're talking about and um, you know and we're just going to ask tonight is it biblical now I mean obviously if you spoke to Christians involved in it and who believe it's of God I mean of course they're going to say it's biblical I mean they're not actually going to say no it's not biblical but what we're going to do is, uh, you know, not just, uh, you know, kind of assume that it's right, but we're going to actually look at the proponents, the evidence they give from the Bible to justify it. And so in going through the Bible, we're going to be asking, is this what the Bible teaches? And those who are into all this, they're saying, well, look, you see it here, here, here in the Bible. We're going to look at those places in the Bible and then we can make our own minds up whether or not what's going on out there today is actually in the Bible as well. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to look at that. But first of all, I just want to address two things that according to the proponents of this, what they claim to be a move of the Spirit of God, I just want to deal with two things you're not really supposed to do all right and the first thing that you're not really supposed to do is question it you're not really supposed to do that you're not actually supposed to raise and question is this of God or not you're supposed to just accept it is these people say it is obvious it's of God and if you do question it or if you do raise doubts about it, you will be told that you're resisting God, that you're grieving the Spirit, or that it's unbelief in you, it's cynicism in you, it's doubting you, it's negative. And of course, all these are things that you need to get free from. So you're discouraged from uh, actually questioning it and seeking to test it. So that's the first thing we're going to look at. The people involved in it would tend to say, no, don't, don't question it, just accept it. If you question it, that you're in danger of resisting God. And of course, who, wants, who would dare resist God? And so therefore people feel they've just got to accept it unquestioningly. So we're going to look at that. And then a second thing that you're not really meant to do is you're not really meant to understand it either. Uh, there's an awful lot of teaching in regards, you know, to sort of like the whole so-called Toronto Blessing type stuff, um, where, you know, sort of like you're told that, you know, don't, don't let your mind get in the way. You know, don't try to understand what God's doing. Uh, I mean, there's someone 
the Holy Spirit has come upon them and causing them to crow like a cockerel. Don't let that, don't, don't question that, don't try and understand it, just accept that that is what God is doing, you know. And you get this, this train of thought that, that God is doing things deliberately that offend people's minds in order to humble them. And so you're not really meant to understand it as well. And it's very frequent when people are encouraged to come forward and to get, you know, uh, you know, the ministry. Often it's quite frequent for people to be encouraged to put their mind to one side. Don't try and understand it. Just receive it. All right. So don't understand it. Just receive it. So there's, there's two things that we're going to look at first. All right. They say, don't question it. Okay, don't question it. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to go through uh, some some scriptures now, and we're going to find out whether the Bible encourages us to take that attitude as well. All right, does the Bible encourage us to just say, well, just accept? No, well, it must be of God. Everyone's saying it's of God. It's supernatural. So therefore, well, it doesn't. You know, let's not question it. Let's just accept it unquestioningly that it is of God. All right. So if you go to 1 Thessalonians, one Thessalonians chapter five, and uh, we'll start from verse 16. Paul says, "Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will." In Christ Jesus for you. Well, we wouldn't argue with any of that, would we? No, no problem there at all. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. And there's Paul saying, don't, don't do anything to get in the way of the gifts of the Spirit. You know, we, we need, you know, to be in a situation where, you know, the Holy Spirit can be moving through us. Absolutely superb. Agree with that completely. Up to now, the Toronto Blessing people will be saying, he's got it, he's seeing the light. Ah, but I'm not going to stop at verse 20. I'm going to read verse 21 as well. Test everything. And notice that Paul says test everything in the context of urging them to make sure that the Holy Spirit can flow freely, freely through, through them and that the gifts of the Spirit and prophesying isn't going to be restricted in the wrong way. And so here we see Paul actually telling us that in order to make sure that the Holy Spirit can flow through us in an unrestrained way, we need to make sure that we are testing everything. And he says, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. So for asking, what does the Bible say? Are we supposed to question whether or not things are of God? Well, here Paul says, test everything. And he says that in the context of the moving of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, I think the Toronto Blessing people would find themselves in disagreement with the Bible on that point. Test everything. So if we ask the question, are we, is it okay to question everything about the Toronto Blessing? Is it okay to question the way that the leaders pass it on? Is it okay to question the very manifestations themselves? Is it okay to question them? Now the Bible tells us not only is it okay, you must, you must test everything. Go to 1 Timothy, chapter 4. And this is the reason why we must test everything. Verse 1, first of all. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So here, Paul's warning, just, just because a spirit is moving, don't just accept that because a spirit is moving that it's the Holy Spirit. It might be deceiving spirits. It might be demons. Go on to verse 6. And he's talking to Timothy as the leader of a church. And he's, you know, warned against... Four. He says, if you point these things out to the brothers, 
you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. So he's saying to Timothy here, look, don't get into bad teaching. No, you follow the true faith, the truths. He says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. So he's telling Timothy, there's stuff that's going to start going on, don't you have anything to do with it? Because it's going to be coming from deceiving spirits. So all we're establishing is that the Bible tells us we must test everything, and here's the reason, because evil spirits are working in order to deceive. So if Satan is working to deceive Christians, we must question everything, because we've got to find out whether something is of God or the devil. So it's obvious that we must test these things. Verse 15, no, verse 11, he says, command and teach these things. See? So he's saying, Timothy, you pass all this stuff on to, you know, the people in the fellowship. And then in verse 15, he says, be diligent in these matters. The context is Timothy teaching what is true and exposing what is false. He says, be diligent in these matters. Make sure you do this well. Make sure you do this thoroughly. He says, give yourself wholly to them. He's saying, be consumed with the issue as the leader of a church, or a leader of a church. Be consumed with the issue as to whether or not deception is coming in. He says, so that everyone may see your progress. He says, make sure people see that you're growing in Lord as, as well. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Make sure you're living right. Make sure you're teaching right. And he says, persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Save them from what? The false teaching, the deception that Paul is warning about. So there we have a leader of a church being commanded very strongly by Paul to make sure that as a leader, Timothy is being faithful in teaching the truth to the fellowship so that they are going to be protected from deception that comes from Satan and evil spirits. Go over into 2 Timothy. Remember we're asking the question, is it okay to question, to test the so-called Toronto blessing? The proponents of it discourage you from doing so and warn you against grieving the spirit, blah, blah, blah. Just accept that it's of God. We're asking, is that, what the, is that the position the Bible would have us take? Well, no, as we're seeing, not in a million years. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1. So this is another letter, you know, to Timothy. And Paul says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Now, I'll just sort of like rephrase that into modern language. All right. Paul is saying to Timothy, remember, Paul is an apostle, one of the twelve, one of the unique apostles given the infallible gospel from Jesus himself. And Paul is saying to Timothy, who isn't such an apostle, and of course no one has been for 2,000 years, all right, he's saying, in the name of God the Father and in the name of Jesus Christ, Timothy, I order you to, right, let's see what it is, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So here Paul is saying, Timothy, this is as important a thing as I've ever said to you. And it's this, preach the word, instruct people carefully. Why? Well, verse 3, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires. And no one's doubting that whatever it is that happens to you when you get Toronto, inverted commas, no one is doubting that it's pleasurable. 
But there are many things that are pleasurable. Doesn't necessarily mean they're good. Doesn't mean they're bad. But look, instead, to suit their own desires, you see, what they enjoy, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, and I love this, keep your head in all situations. Let me ask you a question. When you see at these meetings the state and condition that people end up in, would you say they're keeping their heads? Or would you say that there's a, an abandoning of head, you know, and, and people are given over to it? Well, Paul, uh, here, Paul commands Timothy, keep your head. Go to Proverbs. Trust the old Proverbs. You can never go wrong with Proverbs. Remembering. Is it okay to question these meetings and what's going out on out there in the charismatic movement? And remember, we're doing it as people who, by virtue of the fact that we're baptised with the Spirit and minister the gifts of the Spirit, we're charismatics too. We're not anti-charismatic, but we just want uh, the ministry of the gifts of the Spirit to be done biblically. Right, Proverbs 3, verse 21 my son preserve sound judgment and discernment do not let them out of your sight now how does that square up to you with being encouraged no just put your mind aside don't question it just receive it here preserve sound judgment and discernment do not let them out of your sight well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? And 1 Corinthians 14. This is extraordinarily pertinent, this is. 1 Corinthians 14. And we'll be back to this chapter later. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 29. And this is Paul giving instructions for the ministry of the gifts of the Spirit, particularly prophecy. He says, two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully, test, judge, assess, check. All right, that's, that's what it means, that the Greek word means, all those things. Should weigh carefully what is said. So the point is, if a prophecy is given, do you believe it's a prophecy? Well, the answer is, of course, if, after testing it, it proves to be one. But in these meetings, you're just supposed to accept that what comes out are prophecies. Now then, one of the tests that the Old Testament gave for prophecy is that if it's predictive, could it at least come true, please? Well, that's a fundamental test. I mean, you know, demonic you know, words from the law can come true as well. But at the bare minimum, a prophecy must pass the test of actually, if it's predictive, coming true. All right. Um, so there's a test to apply to all prophecy. Now, one of the things, uh, you know, I mean, prophecy is increasing you know, I mean, like in regards to the Toronto blessing, the Pensacola thing, prophecy is playing a very large part in it all. Now, if I tell you that, um, you know, that 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 in in every year since uh, you know the early seventies, all right, um, that, that's how far I go back on the spirit-filled Christian scene. All right, I can tell you that every year there has always been someone, at least nationally or internationally, recognised as a prophet, prophesying that the following year was going to be the year that revival comes to this country. I would love revival to come to this country. I mean, this one's got to say, whatever. what do these people mean by revival? They would say that the Toronto Blessing is revival. 
Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, sort of what do people mean by it? But I would love to see, uh, you know, met countless people in this country falling on their knees and surrendering to God and repenting of their sins and becoming disciples. Yes, I, I would love to see that. But, I mean, if a prophecy is given that the following year is going to be the year that revival comes to this country, then if that year comes and goes and that prophecy hasn't come true, then it ought to be acknowledged that that prophecy wasn't a prophecy. Now then, there have been, you know, I mean, just the other day on the radio, Blinder and I heard someone who is very involved in the Toronto blessing, blah, 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 and a, a, a nationally, internationally known figure saying that 1997 is going to be the year for revival. Well, I'm going to tell you here and now that in January 1998, we will realise that he was wrong. And one of the reasons I can be so sure of that is that he prophesied that last year was going to be, and it wasn't. One of the more famous you know, prophecies to come out of the early days of the Toronto blessing meetings in Toronto was that 1995 was going to be the year of revival in Great Britain. Now then, what I'm saying is, they weren't prophecies. But what is distracting? These prophecies are given, they clearly don't come true, then they're simply repeated at a later date. Where is the acknowledgement that they're not actually prophecies? And, if I'd been prophesying that something was going to happen next year, all right. If I did that five years on the row and it still hadn't happened, I might start thinking, well, maybe the original prophecy itself wasn't a prophet. You know, but can you see, there's got to come an end to it. There's got to come a time when somebody says, this is just wrong. This is not prophecy. Where the disturbing thing is, um, you know, but you know, it's it's not questioned. It's not tested. If you tested it, you have to say no. It's not prophecy. But um, no, it's just dropped. The last prophecy is dropped, and so it's revised, and, 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 and then it still doesn't come true, so it's dropped, then it's revised. You see, and this, this just goes on ad infinitum, we know this, we can pick up the Christian press, you can read it, you can get these men's tapes, you can hear them saying it on the video, you can get the video where there were prophecies that 1995 was going to be the year of blessing um, you know, sort of, you know, the year of revival in this country, and, and you can I hear the prophecies, and well, they're not come true. Again, the whole word of knowledge thing, okay, that comes up, you know, I mean, we saw it last night, didn't we? You know, this thing, you know, sort of like, you know, this long list of there's someone here with this ailment, there's someone here with that ailment, and do you notice what's the push behind it? They say, the Lord is healing you, or the Lord wants to heal you, right? Now that immediately makes it prophetic, so we can test it, can't we? Question, but they're not healed. Well, let's say that 95% of them aren't. We've yet to find one who has been. But let's say that 5% are. What about the other 95% or whatever? Are we accepting? Is it not okay for us to say they're not words of knowledge then, are they? But you see, what happens is that you just bury the ones that didn't get answered and you just hype up the ones where there's maybe some way of claiming that they did. Can you see? They do. These things do not f pass the test um, of being truly the Holy Spirit moving because they don't, within the terms of what they are themselves, they don't come to pass. They don't happen. You know, sort of like saying God is going to do this and then God doesn't do it. Well, that wasn't a prophecy as simple as that so then what we've done is we've answered or I put to you we've answered the first question people involved in the whole Toronto blessing hyper charismatic thing they will say no don't test it accept it accept it it is of God believe us and if you question it you're grieving the Holy Spirit you're you know resisting God well we've established that the Bible actually commands us to test these things. So don't ever feel, and you will be made to feel, 
that you're the killjoy, you're the unspiritual one, or that even worse, that the mere fact that you're questioning it means you're judging people and that that is wrong. Now then, we must at all times maintain a right attitude towards people. Um, you know, but my goodness, even if other people or, or even, you know, like Satan whispering in your ear, makes you feel that, you know, sort of like you're the negative one or, you know, you're the prophet of doom or you're the deliverer of the cold water over everything. You're doing what the Bible tells you to do. You're testing it. And if something passes the test, we're not going to resist it. We're going to be with it 100%. But this is the very thing that we're trying to establish. Does it pass the test? We've established that we must test it. It must be questioned. And nothing in it is above question. None of the men and women involved in it are above question. None of the teachings are above questions. And none of the so-called manifestations are above question. They must all be tested. And then we've got to answer the question for ourselves. Do we believe they pass the test of being as go of, of God? Now let's... Let's move on to the thing about using our minds, be, be, yeah, because people tend to say, don't try and understand it, uh, you know, just put your mind to one side, just receive. Don't, you know, don't understand it, just receive. Now, obviously, if we're asking the question, can we fully understand anything that God's doing? Well, I mean, we can't fully, under fully understand anything about God. He's infinite. But the point is, we can understand enough and that's the key thing. If you go to a 1 Peter, and again, let's find out what does the Bible say about, um, you know, thinking. <laughs> Are we meant to think? Or should we just put our mind to one side and just receive it, you know? Except that, you know, sort of like, you know, God is doing all these things, people barking like dogs. And, well, no, don't don't think, just just think, so, oh, you don't understand why God's doing that? Well, don't worry, just, just receive it, brother. You know, is it fair enough for us to actually, you know, if, if my mind is offended by something, is it fair enough for me to actually say, well, is it my mind that's wrong or is it the thing that's offending my mind that's wrong? I mean, you know, sort of like if uh, if God says, you know, sort of like Beresford, Jaw, you know, that there's something here that's wrong in your life, you've got to put that right, there's a sin. Well, if that offends my mind, well, in that case, my mind's wrong, isn't it? But uh, when it's a question of someone like, you know, sort of barking like a dog because the Holy Spirit's come upon them, that offends my mind. So I've got to establish what's wrong, my mind, or them barking like a dog. You see what I mean? We need to be humbled in our minds, but being humbled is completely different from saying you don't need to understand, just go ahead blindly. 1 Peter 1 verse 13. Peter says this, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. The AV puts this, uh, gird up the loins of your mind. You know, in the ancient world, they, they all wore dresses, the men as well. I don't know what that says about, you know, sort of like bisexual fashion today. But, you know, I mean, they all wore these long robes. And if they had some running to do, they had to, to hook up their, you know, the men had to hook up their skirts and they run. And what he's saying here is he's saying, look, you know, gather your minds up. Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Well, you know, I mean, I ask you, you know, people lying flat on their backs for an hour, convulsing physically, are you being self-controlled? These are the questions we're asking. Chapter 4, verse 7. He says, The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Now, could you equate this with Peter going around at meetings telling people, no, not don't think about it, just receive. You know, just lie there and convulse a bit longer. Just, just pogo up and down for another half hour or so. 
Peter's saying the exact opposite. He's saying being clear-minded. Don't ever stop thinking. And be self-controlled. And isn't it interesting so that you can pray? With this Toronto thing, people actually get told, no, don't pray, just receive. Don't pray. Because prayer, you're using your reasoning powers, you're using your mind. These people are encouraging you not to. Frightening. Go to Matthew, something that Jesus said. Matthew 22. Verse 37. And this is when Jesus has been asked, what, what's the greatest commandment? Lord, sum it up in one sentence. And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Well, so much for putting our minds on the back burner so God can bless us. No way. Never. Hebrews chapter 8. This is actually the writer to the Hebrews quoting Jeremiah uh, in terms of the new covenant, but nevertheless, Hebrews 8 verse 10, This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. This is the new covenant that we're in. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. You know, the error, the fundamental error that, 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 that this aspect of the charismatic movement has got into is they're saying it all happens in your heart. Put your mind to one side. Let the Holy Spirit move, as it were, in your heart. Your emotions and all that. But no, mind as well. The moment you put your mind to one side, you're going to be in trouble. Romans, Romans chapter 12. I mean, I, 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 I've put loads and loads of scriptures here, but to give us the whole picture, as it were, from the Bible, and then we can make the comparison. Romans chapter 12. says, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So again, what's Paul saying? He said, have your mind renewed, and, and as you have your mind renewed, the truth of the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit of truth, then we're able to test and approve things. We're able to look at things and weigh them with the Bible and say, is this of God or is this not of God? So again, this is not Paul saying, oh, just put your mind to one side. You know, don't, don't think, just receive. <laughs> not at all. He's saying, let your mind be transformed for the express purpose, or, or at least partly, so you can actually test to find out in whatever circumstances you're talking about or thinking about, actually test whether something is God's will or whether it isn't. Um, go to Acts. Acts chapter 8. And uh, just want to, um, this is, uh, my next chapter, right? this is the, when the evangelist Philip is um, transported to the Ethiopian eunuch, who's, uh, you know, sort of uh, travelling through the, uh, through, through the place. Well, we'll actually read it um, from, uh, let's see, where do we want, yeah, verse, verse 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, 
an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now then, crumbs, you know, I mean, here we have an, 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 an angel has sent Philip. I mean, this is, this is high-powered, charismatic stuff going on here. This, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. I mean, an angel is giving Philip instructions and the Holy Spirit is speaking to him in words he can actually hear pretty amazing all right okay let's let, let's see what this leads up to philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading isaiah the prophet now look at what philip says philip asked do you understand what you are reading how can i he said unless someone explains to me so he invited philip to come up and sit with him now then, what does Philip do? Does he get him out of the carriage, get, you know, ministering to him? He doesn't. He says, do you understand? And the bloke says, no, how can I unless someone explains? So Philip, he got up in the, and he explained it to him. Explanation. Incredibly important. As a result of this, the unit became a Christian. But can you see? You can't get more high powered than that, you know, the, 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 you know, I mean, not many people experience what Philip is experiencing here. But what's the emphasis? So the unit could understand all the time what God was doing. Um, if you go to Acts 18. And uh, verse 24. And it says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor, fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained the, to him the way of God more adequately. So here's Apollos, he was a believer and he had so much of the gospel but he'd only been baptised into the baptism of John there was an awful lot he didn't know. And so Priscilla and Aquila take him aside and they explain thing to him. They explain the way of God more adequately. I don't kind of think, oh, well, he's a powerful man and the spirits, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, can you see? So what we're establishing here, all right, is we're simply asking there the question, are we, does the Bible encourage us to just put our mind to one side? You don't understand, don't worry, you don't have to, just receive. Just accept what other people say God is doing. And I'm saying to you that's wrong, that that isn't what the Bible teaches. So we've established two things. When the proponents of this kind of so-called move of the Spirit discourage questioning and testing of it, wanting you to just accept it's of God, you know, sort of like without question, know that that's wrong. If they were truly moving closer to the Holy Spirit, and getting to know him better then they would be discovering that he is the Holy Spirit of truth and that he inspired the Bible and through the Bible urges people to test everything you see so that's a giveaway people who have great experiences of the Holy Spirit and it leads them into the kind of mentality they say, no, don't test it just accept it unquestioningly it's not the Holy Spirit they're experiencing because the Holy Spirit leads into truth not into that kind of error and then secondly when proponents of this type of thing urge you to well you know here, here are things that you know admittedly seem really weird you know people barking like dogs crowing like cockerels 
uh, roaring like lions, uh, lying on the floor, jerking and that. Don't try and understand it. No, don't, don't try and understand what God's doing. Just receive it. Put your, don't let your mind get in the way. Don't try to understand it. Just as it were, get it straight into your spirit, straight into your heart. Let it bypass your mind. Well, again, we've seen from the Bible, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. And again, if someone was growing in the Spirit and becoming more and more familiar with the Holy Spirit of God and His ways, then they would realise that that's the exact opposite to what the Holy Spirit actually wants of people. So we've seen that we must test everything. Nothing is sacrosanct. The only thing that is beyond testing is the Bible itself. But obviously we have to actually get into the Bible to understand what it says. But any so-called manifestation of God, any teaching, anything that's going on, must be tested to see if it is consistent with what the Bible teaches. And if it isn't, it must be rejected. As simple as that. So that's what the Bible encourages us to do. And of course in doing this, we've got to use our minds. We're bringing our reasoning powers to bear. And that is exactly what we are supposed to do in every possible situation. So having established that, we now move on and uh, to say, right, okay, this um, Toronto blessing, the way that these meetings work and and the way it's all going, um, is it biblical? Is it in the Bible? And what what I'm going to do is is I'm going to take you through not an exhaustive, but a comprehensive list of the type of passages in the Bible and the scriptures that they use to say, yeah, what's going on today here, you can see it going on in the Bible. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at their arguments for saying that it's biblical and uh, you know, and then obviously against that background, we're going to make the comparison and say, well, look, yeah, is this, you know, is what we saw last night, for example, fairly low key example last night actually, but is that sort of thing? Can we see that in the Bible? And again, let's just encapsulate what it is we're talking about. We're talking about meetings where those who lead those meetings, there tends to be. A lot of sung worship, well, okay, no problem with that in itself, but it kind of gets a little bit emotional, and then the leaders, they bring it all up to the point where people are encouraged to come forward for this type of ministry, to have hands laid on them, or maybe to be blown on by somebody, or, or you know, whatever, and to, to then fall over and to shake, to jerk, to laugh uncontrollably or whatever. So that that's what we're asking. Do we see those kind of manifestations in those kinds of meetings with the leaders doing those kind of things? Do we see that in the Bible? Right, well if you go to Genesis and let's let's have a look at um and these are all scriptures that proponents of this movement say to justify what's going on biblically all right now in genesis chapter 15 genesis chapter 15 verse 12 as the sun was setting uh, this is god making his covenant with abraham one of the most vital happenings in the history of mankind. This is the coming into being of God's people Israel. The Messiah Jesus was a Jew. This is the, the you know, like salvation unfolding. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, blah 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 and uh, the Lord spoke to him so here Abraham he falls into a deep sleep and, and this great darkness comes over him and while he's in that sleep trance state God makes his covenant with him 
there I say, look, Toronto, it's happening there. Makes me want to know where's the big meeting, where, where are the leaders, where were the people laying hands on Abraham, blowing on him, you know, the laughter, the jerking. Uh, this was a kind of th thick and dreadful darkness. But anyway, I just say that there they say, look, 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 there's an example of it. So what you see at our meetings, look, it happened to Abraham. Maybe missing out the fact that Abraham wasn't at a meeting at all. Let alone a meeting where, uh, see, what happened here, this just happened to Abraham. No one was gearing him up for it. He wasn't surrounded by other people all gearing each other up for it. And here's the most important thing. This was Abraham and God. There was no human agency involved in this at all. And that, I put to you, being the key giveaway that this thing is a deception. There was no human agency involved here at all. Anyway, that's just one. We've got to move on to others. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Now this is when eventually Solomon's temple is completed and the Lord moves in. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. Uh, well in verse 11, the priests then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there consecrated themselves and then in verse 12 it says there was 120 of them and in verse 13 the trumpeters and singers joined in unison as with one voice to give praise and thanks to the Lord um, accompanied by trumpet cymbals, cymbals and other instruments they raised their voices in praise to the Lord and saying he is good his love endures forever this is sung praise and worship no problem here great brilliant then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud and here the Shekinah glory comes in and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God and they say look here it is the presence of God so comes into the meeting that the priests couldn't perform their duty anymore and then they go and surmise that they're all lying flat on their backs or something like that all right Again, is this an example of the so-called Tronto blessing? Well, let me ask you, these priests, these were the guys who were leading the service. They couldn't do anything. But at the Tronto blessing meetings, it's the leaders who are doing it. You see? You see that total fundamental difference? How can anyone point to this when the priests in the temple, the place was so filled with the glory of God that they were unable to continue. How can anyone compare that with the Toronto blessing? It's the leaders who are handing it out. And again, can you see the point here, with the presence of the Lord coming in the temple to such an extent that no one could do anything anymore, there was no human agency all human agency stopped that's the point this wasn't the priests handing out God's blessing so that the people couldn't go on anymore the priests were stopped in what they were doing but what were the priests doing? they were worshipping that's all this isn't a meeting with people out front whipping everyone up and bringing the power of God down on them. This is the power of God coming into the meeting quite spontaneously and no one could do anything anymore. Well, no one's got any objection to that here. Again, there's no comparison between that, I put it to you, and so-called Toronto blessing meetings. Let's go to Ezekiel. All we're asking is, are these descriptions of Toronto blessing meetings that's all are we seeing these sort of meetings here in the Bible now then Ezekiel chapter 1 first of all and it's worth bearing in mind that, that you know that, that these are not unintelligent people 
who are using the Bible in this way. I mean, there are one or two laughs coming up in a minute, I'm afraid. I, I, don't, I wish there weren't. Um, right, Ezekiel 1 verse 28. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. Ezekiel, he has a vision of God in, in all his glory. And, you know, he, he tries to describe it, although he's at a complete loss. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now, that's quite interesting, that. He's not saying, this is the glory of the Lord. He's not even saying, look, this is the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He says, this is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. I mean, he just cannot describe what he's seeing. He's seeing God's glory in such a way that it's beyond description. And he says, when I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. So he has this vision of the Lord and then an angel speaks to him. And as a result, when I saw it, I fell face down. Is uh, well let's 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 just go over to chapter three and verse twenty-three. Um he goes off now to do his thing. I got up and went out to the plain and the glory of the Lord was standing there like the glory I had seen by the Kibar River. When, when he says the glory of the Lord was standing there, suddenly again he's face to face with Jesus in all his glory. Jesus is the glory of the Lord. The writer to the Hebrews says that in chapter 1. Um, and he says, and I fell face down. So here we see twice Ezekiel sees God in all his glory, has a revelation of, indeed of Jesus in all his glory. And the effect this has is I fell face down. Do we have here the Tronto blessing? Now will you just note that on the charismatic scene people don't fall face down, they fall on their backs. It's a small point but I think it's worth noting and again we've got to ask was Ezekiel at a meeting here with people up the front urging him and great singing going on urging him to come forward and is anyone laying hands on him is anyone blowing the Holy Spirit on no this is something this is just happening spontaneously between Ezekiel and the Lord He's not even with anyone else. Now, it's interesting. Joel was saying a while ago that, um, you know, sort of like, um, you know, one person who he knows has these manifestations, these Tronto type things, just on his own when he's on his own. And indeed, lots of people do. But again, what you've got to realise is that when this is happening, these are people, they're only carrying on on their own what has started at the meetings they've been to when they got the blessing. You see what I mean? So that, that's not the same, because these are people, they, you know, they go to the big meetings and it happens to them there, or it starts happening in their churches, and then it happens to them when they're on their own as well. But can you see, it started off at one of the meetings with the leadership from the front, you know, urging people to you know, to do it, and then going down and having hands like, and surrendering themselves to it. So again, we're seeing here with Ezekiel, I put it to you, this is a million light years from, uh, you know, what the charismatic movement is doing at the moment. Um, go to Daniel. Worth noting as well, I, I, you know, I really do think that if I saw Jesus in all his glory, I don't think I would be standing up either. But, um, but say with that bloke last night, to go down and stand in front of him, I, I don't feel any compulsion to go down and stand in front of him and then fall over because I'm standing in front of a mere human being. Ezekiel was standing in front of Jesus. Well, I think I would be hugging his, his knees 
his feet and I would be face down. I wouldn't be on my back. I'd be face down, prostrate on the ground. Big difference that. Daniel chapter 8, verse 17. Um, now, the angel, um, an angel starts talking to Daniel. So an angel comes to him. As he, that is the angel, not not the speaker at the Toronto meeting, but, uh, you know, the Toronto blessing meeting, this is an angel, right? As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Then verse 18, while he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. Just notice there, again, they would say, look, here it is. Now, a Toronto meeting, what happens is a man touches you and then you fall over. And you fall over on your back. What happened to Daniel here is he sees the angel, he falls on his face. Then he goes into a deep sleep. Then the angel touches him and he stands up. It's an angel, it's not a man. And he gets touched after he's fallen over. He doesn't fall over because he's been touched. Can you see all these differences? They're profound. And again, what is the most profound difference here? He's not at a meeting. It's just him on his own and an angel comes to him. I can imagine in suit. I might be doing funny things in that instance. And again, prostrate on the ground, face down. Um, chapter 10 simply because it's another um, another example. Um, he says, I was left alone gazing at this great vision. Well, no, let's start from verse 7. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. Now, Daniel is about to have another such manifestation from the Lord. But will you notice, on this occasion, he's with other people. What's the first thing that happens? They split. The Lord moves them off so that Daniel is on his own when it happens. Can you see there's no possibility of group dynamics working here? It's the exact opposite. And he says, I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left my face turned deathly pale I was helpless I heard him speaking I listened to him I fell into a deep sleep my face to the ground this is him and an angel and again it's face down now then a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees he starts to get up when the angel touches him he hasn't fallen on his back because a man has touched him do you see the profound difference? The Toronto blessing is almost like, or this thing in the charismatic movement, it's almost like a topsy-turvy mirror image of the genuine here. And in the genuine, it's Jesus himself or an angel, all right? In the Toronto, it's a mere man. Uh, they go down on their face in the charismatic movement, it's on their back. And they're touched in order so they can get up. In the charismatic movement, you fall down because you're touched. Can you see everything is... Yeah, it's all distorted. Why? Because it's a counterfeit. Of course it's distorted. It's a counterfeit. Um, go to Matthew. Matthew, chapter 17. We've seen... Angels. And if the sort of thing we're seeing here happened to us, wow, <laughs> that would be fantastic. But you can do nothing to make it happen, and the odds are it never will. But wouldn't it be fantastic if it did? Who knows? It might. Yes, please, Lord. Right, Matthew 17, verse 6. Now, this is the transfiguration, all right? Uh, the disciples have gone up on the mountain with Jesus, all right? Jesus is there chatting with Moses and Elijah. Kind of Peter, James and John, they're kind of... 
they're looking on there's Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah all right then what happens is that Moses and Elijah kind of like vanish all right and this bright this bright cloud comes down on them and Moses and Elijah vanish and then God the Father speaks out of the cloud um, to them <laughs> about Jesus who's standing there in all his glory when the disciples heard this they fell face to the ground terrified but Jesus came and touched them get up he said don't be afraid when they looked up they saw no one except Jesus now then look they're seeing Jesus in all his glory and God the Father speaks to them directly from heaven and Moses and Elijah have just vanished into a cloud now look they're terrified they're not laughing they're not even chortling there's not a giggle here all right now then again it's Jesus in all his glory the Toronto blessing is a man they fall to the ground face down in the Toronto blessing you go down on your back usually having gone down Jesus touches them and then says get up in the Toronto blessing you're touched and then you go down can you see how consistent this is this isn't a coincidence this is because what's happening out there is a parody it's a warped, twisted, you know, thing of the real. Um, go to Matthew 28 now. Again, I'm bringing all these scriptures because these are the ones they quote. That's why I'm going through. I'm just, I'm following their, you know, this is their itinerary, <coughs> as it were, biblically speaking. Matthew 28 verse 4 now um, this is the angel that appears at the tomb just after Jesus has died and just prior to him being raised from the dead uh, and this is talking about the angel his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men so you know I mean here here with Roman gods they see the angel and, and they, they just you know again it's not a Toronto blessing meeting here is it again it's it's confronted with an angel and these are unbelievers these gods no indication they got converted they went off and they uh, lied to the um, you know to the Roman guard they you know the chief priest got in there and said well look tell this lie and so they did they didn't get converted but they were confronted with an angel and they were just terrified they just sank to the ground um, there's another instance uh, when the disciples in the garden of Gethsemane actually turn up to rest Jesus and they say to him are you blah 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 you know and he says I am and that's the messianic name isn't it I am when God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush and uh, they they sank to the ground like dead men it's like the glory of Jesus just flashed through and they just kind of like sank, sank to the ground like dead men but again that was Jesus that was Jesus. I wasn't standing in front of the guy who was speaking last night. That was that was Jesus. Um, go to Acts. Let's have a look at Paul's conversion. Because they say that he got trontoed. Acts chapter 9, verse 4. <coughs> Uh, uh, let's see as we'll start from verse 3 as, as Paul neared Damascus on his journey suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him Saul Saul why do you persecute me who are you Lord Saul asked I am Jesus whom you are persecuting now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do uh, the men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. Well, my understanding was at the Toronto Blessing meetings, at least last night, they were trying to get the blind man to see. Weren't they? That guy was blind. He couldn't see. There wasn't a miracle there. They said there was. There wasn't. Um, but, but here, this isn't Toronto Blessing. Here, God actually strikes someone blind. 
don't think there are any claims that that happens in Toronto blessing meetings. And if it did, I mean, would so many people go? Would everyone want to be there? I think not. Yeah. And again, this is, Paul is not at a meeting. He's just travelling. He's about his business, well, which was persecuting Christians. But the point was, God just sets on him. And the thing is that here, I mean, this this light flashes all around him. All right. And it says that he fell to the ground. We know that he was riding a donkey. There's nothing to suggest here that it was even that he, you know, he, he fell off his donkey. He was startled. I mean, I'm not surprised. You know, so again, it's... <laughs> to me, it is people who are very desperate to prove a point if they're using these scriptures that we're seeing in order to try and justify it. Uh, go, go to Acts chapter 10, next chapter. Vision that Peter has. was the key vision that Peter had when uh, the Lord got through to him that the gospel was for Gentiles as well and that he was quite free to go and mix with the Gentiles because he wasn't under the law anymore it was the new covenant and uh, Acts 10.10 10. Um, uh, Peter became this is what's happened is that Cornelius uh, has sent his gen well you know Cornelius was a Gentile and they've set off they've been told by the Lord to go and get Peter so they've set off all right um, Peter uh, went up on the roof to pray he became hungry and wanted something to eat while the meal was being prepared he fell into a trance he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners and then you know, we're not interested in what the vision was but Peter fell into a trance all right and in that trance state he received the vision now then again is this Toronto blessing make certain points he's on his own no big meeting no emotional choruses no leaders up the front no string of people testifying what happened to them when they got Toronto <laughs> Uh, no kind of I want you to come down to the front you know and sort of I've just got a word of knowledge there's someone with a you know sort of like you know they've got dermatitis on their left ear come down to the front Lord wants to heal you it sounds like a parody but it isn't it isn't that is what these meetings are actually like so can we see this this couldn't be you know I mean not 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 people filing down all whipped up and so Peter joins them and go and then someone lays hands on him and down he goes couldn't be further from that and what's interesting as well all right was at the point when he fell into a trance state because i mean one might say what well, he's praying isn't he and you know maybe in prayer it's getting very intense and he's getting a bit whipped up this is interesting peter went up on the roof to pray he became hungry and wanted something to eat while the meal was being prepared he fell into a trance now this is it, Pete, he's gone up to pray. He's done his praying and he's decided he's hungry. I mean, this isn't some intense spiritual state he's whipping himself up into. He's, he's thinking about his stomach now. So he's sent down and they're getting his dinner ready for him. He's probably carrying on praying. But then he falls into the trance. He was thinking about his dinner. Trying to pray, but thinking about his dinner. So we can't even say, this isn't, you know, like when people get into a big prayer session and try and, you know, sort of like really pray intensely and focus and then as a result of that you've whipped yourself into a trance. Is Peter doing that? No, Peter has kind of, he's, he's broken his prayer time to order dinner. And then he's gone back to praying while he's waiting for his dinner. Dinner's coming any minute. Then... Now, can you see, this is not something Peter did. It came upon him in a sovereign act of God. We're a million light years away still from the Tronto blessing. Uh, Revelation chapter 1.
and uh, verse 17 well no let's start to um, yes let's um, from verse 13 among the lampstands was someone like the son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash round his chest his head and hair were white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were blazing fire his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters in his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword his face was like the sun shining in all his brilliance uh, verse 18 um, this man identifies himself I am the first and last I am the living one I was dead and behold I am alive forever and ever John is praying Jesus comes to him he sees Jesus in all his glory verse 17 when I saw him I fell at his feet as though dead no meeting no choruses no leaders up the front no being urged to get ministry no so called words of knowledge no crowds of people filing down to the front jerking around screaming getting whipped up encouraging you to go and get blessed just like them no one coming up laying hands on him blowing on him fanning the Holy Spirit on him he's praying on his own and Jesus reveals himself to him and I'd say at this point that if you want one thing the, the one thing that disqualifies the Toronto Blessing and the Pentagon and all this stuff the one thing that actually disqualifies it from being a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit is the human agency involved we're seeing quite specifically in the Bible whenever things like this happened if there was any human agency there it was actually removed first the Toronto blessing depends on group dynamics depends on leaders at the front depends on being not coming directly from God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit or indeed even angels but needs to be channeled through other human beings the very thing here we're seeing in all these scriptures didn't happen um, one of the teachers involved in the Toronto church itself is a guy called Guy Chevro um, he's important because he's written one of the more scholarly books about the Toronto blessing all right uh, he's not actually part of the Toronto church he's in another church in Toronto but he does teaching there and he's all for it and I just want to um if you go to Psalm 23 one of the verses that he quotes as being scriptural justification for the Toronto blessing now he is a Bible teacher he is an intelligent man he is learned in the scriptures he is a mature Christian he's giving this verse as justification for the Toronto blessing the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures and you've really got to ask yourself there are some Bible believing mature believers being deceived somewhere around here if this verse can be seriously quoted in a book about the Toronto blessing as a scriptural precedent all the others that I've taken you through tonight it, it's, it's sad I mean if it wasn't so sad it would actually be funny that anyone could seriously you know quote that verse in that context let's do Acts chapter 2 now saved it for last because this is the one that when all else fails hook out Acts chapter 2 One's a, one bit of it is a bit silly but another bit needs a bit more explanation 
Acts chapter 2 um, in, 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 in verses 1 to 4 you get you know the Holy Spirit comes upon them tongues of fire they speak in tongues um, and uh, people you know sort of gather round and say that they've um, that they're drunk they've had too much wine verse 14 then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd now the first point is uh, you know he says these men are not drunk as you suppose it's only nine in the morning now then Peter stood up with the eleven why did Peter stand up we had to stand up so he was flat on his back because they'd been trontoed hadn't they and of course here it says Peter stood up and of course that must mean mustn't it it's undeniable that there was a Tronto style meeting going on and they were all flat on their back jerking around and Peter stood up I mean that's the silly bit but this is believe me this is what they say Peter stood up that's proof that they were a bit unbelievable but the more serious point here is that people were saying that they were drunk so therefore is this you know was it a Toronto style meeting well we do know all right uh, that there have been tongues of fire over their head uh, I mean no doubt they were very uninhibited in their praise and worship and their evangelism at this point um, you know I, mean, I, I was extremely uninhibited when I was first baptized with the spirit myself and it was wonderful um, but also they're suddenly speaking all these languages that they didn't know and all the people surround understand them all in all their different languages obviously something weird was going on but the thing is that I just want to you know sort of like raise this point uh, does the drunkenness here mean that it was a Toronto blessing type thing now if you go to um, 1 Chronicles sorry 1 Samuel not 1 Chronicles 1 Samuel and I just want to read you um, this was Hannah who didn't have any children and eventually she gave birth to the baby who became the prophet Samuel and um, and what's happening is that she's going down to the temple she's praying, praying for a son verse 12 as she kept on praying to the Lord Eli observed her mouth Eli is the priest Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving but her voice was not heard so she was mouthing the prayers but she wasn't speaking out loud Eli thought she was drunk and said to her how long will you keep on getting drunk get rid of your wine and then Hannah explained well I, I just quote this to say that biblically as far as the Jews were concerned you didn't have to be doing very much to appear drunk so it's just that when it was that they appeared drunk at Pentecost the point was they were free in their praise in their you know proclamation of the gospel it was obviously odd what was going on but it, we, we don't need for one moment to believe that they were hopelessly lying on the ground and not able to get up that they were making animal noises or anything like that at all um, it's, it's, it's just again really you know bad use of the Bible back to 1 Corinthians 14 winding up now 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33 Paul says for God is not a God of disorder but of peace I ask you at these meetings whether or not if it's the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit creating disorder and then verse 40 but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way context of those two verses the rules for ministering the gifts of the Spirit everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way worth noting that um, the Daily Telegraph sent one of their reporters over to uh, Toronto um, in 1994 when it was gaining momentum a reporter called Mick Brown uh, and in the uh, Daily Telegraph 30th of December 1994 he recounted his experience how he went to report on the meeting went forward was knocked off his feet when um you know like the leader there touched him knocked off his feet said it was absolutely fantastic couldn't couldn't under laugh, laughing like a drain he said thought it was fantastic 
didn't become a Christian though but wrote his article and reported it nothing you know the manifestations happened to him but he, he didn't see it as God speaking to him it just happened to him he couldn't explain it but he thought it was noteworthy so he wrote an article about it um you know so you know I put this to you two more verses to end off Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13 Um, Paul says for such men are false apostles now I'm not saying that the he's talking about particular people in the Corinthian church I'm not saying that uh, the people involved in, in Toronto are that you'll see the bit that I'm wanting deceitful workmen masquerading as apostles of Christ and no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light it is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. And I read you that verse simply to establish that Paul makes quite clear just because something might be supernatural and might have appearances that it might be God doesn't necessarily mean that it is. How would you establish one way or the other? The scriptures. And I've taken you through a fairly comprehensive, not all of them, we'd be here all night, but a fairly comprehensive list of the verses that the proponents of the Toronto Blessing use to say that um, it's biblical. I put it to you that if I was to uh, prepare a list of verses to show that the Toronto Blessing isn't biblical, I would actually pick exactly the same verses that they do. And how they can be saying that uh, these verses are examples of the Toronto blessing. How you can say that Jesus revealing himself to someone physically or an angel appearing physically can be compared to these leaders at the front. That falling on your back is the same as being prostrate on your face. That being on your own can equate to being in a meeting with hundreds of people and that you know being touched as you get up equates with being touched when you, before you fall over you see the comparisons they they they're just hopeless in fact they're not comparisons they're mirror images almost like a you know matter antimatter and um that i think is is disturbing it's a very disturbing element in it but Nevertheless, on the strength of all that, it's become clear where I stand through this talk. But anyway, you know, is the Toronto Blessing biblical on the basis of the arguments of its proponents from the Bible? You've got everything you need to make your own decision about it. Right, we'll finish. <laughs>